There's so much in this particular passage of scripture that Paul speaks about uh, that we're, we're really just going to skim over the surface of it. But uh, even so, uh, there are some valuable things that Paul would like for us to hear and uh, some things that we as God's people here in Beaconsfield would do well to not only hear but also put into practice. Uh, well, Paul's uh, letter to the church in Thessalonica, uh, particularly this passage of scripture chapter 4 it is uh, divided I think into six very easily identifiable sections Uh, verse 1 is the introduction not too difficult to work out verses 2 to 6 8 is instruction instruction actually concerning lust in verses 6b to 8 there's a warning Paul often gives us a warning in his letters warnings that we Uh, would do well to heed. In verses 9 to 12, he goes back into instruction, this time instruction concerning love and particularly the love that we have for our brothers and sisters in Christ. In verses 13 to 17, Paul gives us some further instruction concerning Christians who have died. And then in verse 18, we have a conclusion. Now, what becomes immediately obvious, I'm sure, as you look at that that slide, is that one-third of chapter 4 is devoted almost entirely to a theology of death and dying. One third of an entire chapter devoted to the theology of death and dying. And believe it or not, can't do anything about it, it is something that will affect us all and it's important therefore that we think about it. Certainly Paul thought about it, didn't he? He thought about it enough to write considerably in a number of his letters about that very thing. And in order to think right about it, Paul takes time to teach us. He wants us to understand some important truths when it comes to death and dying and he wants us to apply those truths in our lives, yes, for our own peace of mind, but also as a witness to the world and to God's glory. And so what Paul does is he instructs this small church in in Thessalonica about how they should think about living. And he writes to this small church in Thessalonica about how it is that they should think about dying. How we think, says Paul, is important. And the reason it's important is because it affects how we live. How we approach our own death and how we approach the death of our loved ones affects, doesn't it? how we live in the world and it has an enormous effect upon our witness to those men and women who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and who do not have the hope that we have. I was having a conversation with a, uh, with a young man toward the end of last year uh, and I, uh, it was tremendously courageous of him to knock on my door and, and come to talk to me and he, he began the conversation by Uh, telling me about his ongoing struggle with sin. It's a wonderful conversation to have. All of you who have struggle with sin, find someone that you can trust and be courageous enough to invite them in to the walk that you're having. And that's what this man did. He was beginning to feel the weight of conviction that was bearing down upon him and in desperation, what did he do? Well, in desperation, he did what we should all do, but which we seldom do. He reached out to someone who he considered to be trustworthy and someone who perhaps was mature in the Lord, and he decided to talk about it. And one of the things to come out of our discussion was a consideration of two very important doctrines, the doctrine of justification and the doctrine of sanctification, justification and sanctification. The point being this, the moment we truly believe We stand at that moment justified before a holy and an altogether righteous God. That church is the doctrine of justification. It's why we need to be encouraging one another in that particular doctrine so that when when God looks at us, what what he sees is is a righteousness that has been credited to us, credited to you and, and credited to me, not because of anything we have done, but because of what Christ has done for us and on our behalf. That's what God sees when he looks at us. And nothing we do can undo what Christ has done. 
What that does not mean, however, <clears throat> is that our struggle with sin is over. And we are justified. But our struggle with sin is far from over. And because that is the case, the process of sanctification will continue until either Christ returns or until he takes us home. And so what does Paul do? He, he teaches those who are engaged in the process of sanctification what justification looks like, what being holy looks like. And as they think about all that Paul is teaching them, the Holy Spirit will begin to convict and, and shape those who are being so taught so that they will become over a period of time that which they already are. God sees us as justified. When we look in the mirror, we don't often see it. And so sanctification is the process of becoming what we already are. And so Paul teaches God's people by addressing real concerns as they live in a world that does not know who God is. And the truth of the matter is this, much of the Christian life will be spent in learning. You don't stop learning when you finish year 12 or when you finish university. The moment you pick up your cross and follow Jesus is the moment that real learning truly begins. We learn how it is that we are to live in a world that does not know God. In a world that lives according to a standard that is not God's own standard. And so Christians will spend their entire lives learning. And, and depending upon a whole range of criteria, the focus of our learning will be, will be different today, perhaps, than it was yesterday. What it is that God wants to teach us today may, in fact, be different to that which he wanted to teach us yesterday. And when we move from one region to another, it may necessarily shift again. In, in Australia today, as a general rule, now, there are exceptions to this rule, of course, but as a, as a general rule, Christians won't have to be taught to persevere in the face of persecution. If you move to Afghanistan or Pakistan or some parts of India or Saudi Arabia or North Korea, that is exactly what you will have to learn. You will have to learn how to persevere in the face of persecution. And so Paul will have things to say to you about how you live your life wherever it is that God has planted you. And, and if you're a young man and you live in Berwick, you will almost certainly have to learn how to turn away from temptation. You'll have to learn how to spot it. If you're a young man, you'll have to learn how to defend yourself against it. And every one of us, young and old alike, we will have to learn how to live in a culture that is shaped by consumerism. Paul has something to say to us about exactly that. And if you grew up in a household where you, where you missed out on the love of a father, you, you may have to learn what a loving father looks like so that you will learn to love as God himself loves and so that you will learn to fully trust your heavenly father. These are the things that God would have us learn. And if you were raised in a permissive household, you may have to learn what discipline looks like it's why speaking about discipline in the life of the church today is a difficult thing because young people don't know what discipline is. They have a freedom that when I was growing up I never knew. And it's not a good freedom. It's a difficult freedom. And all of us need to think differently than the world thinks. We need to think differently, don't we, about marriage. We need to think differently about sex. We, we need to think differently about gender and the nature of tolerance and the value of life, about truth. Do you see? These are the things that Paul is keen for the Christians in Thessalonica and the Christians right around the world. He's keen for them to hear and to learn and to know. From the moment we pick up our cross and follow Jesus to the moment we breathe our last breath, we are learning Right up to that moment, we're learning. We're learning because we're disciples. That's why we're learning. 
To be a disciple is to be a disciplined learner. To be a disciple is to, is to commit ourselves to listening to and following in the footsteps of Jesus. That's what it means to be a, a disciple. And so when we come to a passage like 1 Thessalonians 4, it shouldn't surprise us to find that Paul is teaching his brothers and sisters what, what they need to learn in order to be God's image bearers in the world that God has planted them, in a world where God's image is marred and hidden. And of course, that is no less true of us. It's no less true of the Christians that God has planted in this corner of his vineyard. We are God's image bearers here in Berwick and Officer and Beaconsfield and Clyde and Narrawarren. And just like the Christians living in Thessalonica, we are called to learn more and more about what that looks like. <laughs> what, what does it look like to be a Christian here in this corner of God's vineyard? What does it mean for you? What does, it, what does it mean for me? How to be God's reflection, his image bearer is where we live. And they're really important questions. They're the most important questions, in fact, that we have to ask. And it's important when we read Paul that, that we understand something. We need to understand that, that we don't learn in order to become what we are not. No, no, no. We learn in order to become what we already are. That's what Paul is saying. And what we are, church, are God's dearly beloved. And so let's continue learning this morning by looking at Paul's introduction. Before we do that, let's pray. Uh, Father God, we do thank you that uh, we can hear your voice very clearly as we open up your word and as we spend time sitting at the feet of men like Paul. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we can know what it means to be a holy people in this place. Lord, I thank you that you have laid it upon the hearts of men and women this morning to come and present themselves before your throne and to submit themselves to the Lordship of Jesus by learning what it is that you would have them do. And so bless them with your word, give them understanding, tra transform each one of us more into the image of Christ as we sit at Paul's feet and as we learn from him. We pray it Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. And so Paul has uh, received word, probably from Timothy. Timothy has made his uh, way back to uh, to Paul, the, the, the Christians that he has left in, in Thessalonica, that they now have a number of questions, uh, because they've been left on their own for a while, that need addressing. And these are the things that Paul refers to as other matters. And, and notice firstly how it is that Paul, he, he, he doesn't lord it over them. He, he, he doesn't instruct them from a position of knowledge that places him above them, does he? And it's a really important thing to see. What, what does he call them? He calls them his brothers and sisters. Paul is an older brother teaching his younger siblings how it is that they are to live. An older brother teaching his younger siblings what it is that pleases their father. It's a lovely picture, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a lovely picture. You don't see this in antiquity, but you see it in Scripture. The Apostle Paul, an older brother, taking his younger brothers and sisters aside and teaching them what it means to live in such a way that their heavenly father is pleased. You see, there's an, there's an intimacy in the Christian church that is unlike any other gathering. Certainly if you look at Paul's letters, there is an intimacy. And it's not something that you can easily miss. Yes, Paul has authority. Yes, the word that, that Paul brings is authoritative. He's an He's an apostle, no less. He's been commissioned by God himself. He has God's own stamp of approval. And those who would seek to oppose Paul, Paul quickly addresses. You see, the church is not a free-for-all. Yes, we love one another, but Paul won't allow the church to, to live as it pleases. <laughs> There are certain rules that need to be followed, rules that 
lift up and exalt the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is called to follow those who follow Christ. The church is to be a disciplined community. But but Paul is also always modelling that at the heart of Christian fellowship is family. At the heart of Christian fellowship is family and it is a family that is led by God's spirit. Not just any family. God has called us into his own family. And so who is Paul? Well, Paul is first and foremost their brother. That's who Paul is. There's no rank, is there, in the church of the living God? Yes, Paul is an apostle and and what he says should be listened to and what he says should be applied. And likewise today, there are those that God has gifted to the church to be teachers. There are some that have been called by God to be pastors. There are some who have been called by God to be elders and they have have a task to teach and to train and to model, yes, to model, the gospel to other believers, men who will be called by God to account for the leadership that they have shown or not shown. That's a big responsibility that lays upon, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, I think, in the coming weeks, upon Stephen's shoulders and upon Rod's shoulders and upon my shoulders. And so the office we hold is an important office, one that comes with important responsibility, a responsibility that should never, ever be taken lightly. But at the heart of every relationship that exists in the church, every relationship, is the knowledge that we are family. It's a wonderful, wonderful truth to allow it to sink into our hearts. All of us, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I could leave that there and not say anything else, and I think we'd all understand readily enough what that means. But I just wanted to highlight for a moment, if I may, the the extreme nature of what it is that Paul has just said. Because sometimes we read what he says, we read it, but the words kind of just wash over us. They don't really sink in. But listen listen to what what he says. You see, those he calls his brothers and sisters, they are what? Well, a lot of them are former idolaters. Some of them, even as they meet, are slaves. And some of them are slave owners. Some are wealthy, successful aristocrats and some have absolutely no rights at all, certainly not the rights of a free man or a free woman. And Paul calls all of them what? He calls all of them, his brothers and his sisters. And it really does get to the heart of what it means to be the church of the living God. And it grieves me when I don't see that sort of thing happening in the church of the the living God. It gets to the heart of who it is that, that, that you rub shoulders with every time you come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about that for a moment. Who is Paul? And Paul is, and he tells us as much, a Hebrew amongst Hebrews. Paul is a man who has been born of the tribe of Benjamin. He's one of only two tribes that remained faithful for the most part, faithful to the God who who rescued his people and placed them in the land of promise. And here is this man, here is this Hebrew of Hebrews calling a former idolater, perhaps even a slave, his brother, his sister. Now that should instruct us how it is that we regard one another. Who is it, church, that you sit beside every week? Church, as you sit here today, you do so amongst your brothers and sisters. That's who you sit beside. God has done something in us, something quite extraordinary that has connected us, not only for this life, but for all all eternity. We are brothers and sisters. It's a remarkable thing. People who can't afford a home are brothers and sisters with those who live in 10-bedroom mansions. People who are filled with shame are are, are brothers and sisters with those who aren't. Why? Because God has done a work in their lives. It's a remarkable thing. It's a remarkable thing who we are. It's a remarkable thing, the people that we sit beside. (laughs) They're your brothers and they're your sisters. 
Together and only together are we going to inherit the kingdom of God. Together and only together are we going to sit at our Father's table. Together and only together will we be welcomed by our Lord to reign alongside him when he returns to rule as the king of the cosmos. And so when Paul writes the words, brothers and sisters, although it's easy to skip over them, we really shouldn't just skip over them. We should marvel at what it is that God has done through the death of his son. We should marvel at it. And so let's move on. In verses 3 to 6, Paul writes these words. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. There's that word that we spoke of a little bit earlier. That wonderful word, the word sanctified. And so what is Paul saying? Well, what he's saying is this. Don't think that just because you are justified that there still isn't any work to do. Paul is saying, look at at your lives. That you are justified. It is wonderful that, that God, when he looks upon you, what he sees is the righteousness of his son. And that's what he does see. It is worth celebrating. The moment you truly believed, you were made justified in God's sight. Once you were dead, now you are alive. It's a reversal of the the order of the world. The world looks at everyone and thinks they're all alive, and one day they're going to die. No, 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 no. In the church, that's not true. In the church, we're all dead. Well, certainly were. And now we've been made alive. The moment God's spirit opened our eyes and we responded to his call, we stepped out of the darkness and, and into the light. And, and church, when it, when, it, when it sinks in what God has done, it should fill us with such joy and amazement that when we begin to worship, as we gather with our brothers and sisters, then we, we simply don't want to stop. We don't want it to end. That we do want it to stop, or that we find ourselves preoccupied with something else, testifies to the ongoing need for our sanctification. That's what that means. Now, as far as the Christians living in Thessalonica go, sanctification will necessarily focus on a number of things that were considered normal in their culture. And so when it comes to our sanctification, God is going to focus on those things that are considered normal in our culture. And because they were normal in their culture, the danger was that they would soon be introduced into and become normal in the life of the church. And what was, what was normal church in the culture around them was what? Well, Paul tells us what was normal was sexual immorality. Do not live in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. We see that in verse 5. And the word here translated lust is the word passion. It's a, it's a word that communicates to us a, a dominating power. You give yourself over to it. And in giving yourself over to this power, it then has power over you. It, it, it controls you. And it's the same idea we have when we speak of Christ's passion. Christ gave himself over to the power of death. He submitted himself, didn't he, to its power. And the Apostle Paul instructs his brothers and sisters not to give themselves over in in passionate lust the way that the, the culture around them did. He says, love your brothers and sisters. He says, don't take advantage of anyone. Treat one another with with respect and and brotherly love, with sisterly love. And recognise here that Paul is not calling upon the pagan culture of Thessalonica to change. Paul is not asking them to change. Just as we need to be very careful when we point at the world and we ask the world to change. Paul doesn't do that. Paul doesn't do that because they can't change. They can't change because they don't have access to the power of God. They don't know God. No, no. Paul calls upon Christians to change. He calls those who do know God to change. He calls upon them to change because their hearts have been changed. Their hearts have been softened. And notice the means by which the change is going to come. Paul writes to them that you should learn to control your own body. God will will bring about change as you do what? 
God will bring about change as you learn. Don't poo-poo learning. Don't dismiss Bible study midweek because you've had your fill on a Sunday morning. God will bring about change as we learn. Now, now sometimes change will come about dramatically. It'll come about instantly. The Spirit will, will change both your desire and your direction the moment you believe. Now, sometimes that will happen. I can tell you stories of people and the change has been extraordinary. You can tell me stories like that too, I'm sure. Can you tell me stories like that? I know of a man who was... Well, not only would you not want to meet him in a dark alley, you wouldn't want to meet him in the light. He was a wicked, wicked man. And in the space of a moment, God softened his heart. You say, what happened? I can tell you what happened. The Spirit of God changed him. Why is that? It's because God is alive. He's real. He works in the world. It was in incredible. It was, it was amazing. But often what happens is that we will learn what it is and what it isn't that is pleasing to God. We will apply ourselves to the reading of God's word. We will, we will listen to what it is that pleases the one in whose image we have been created. And as we think upon God's word, God's spirit will then convict us. What we thought was acceptable, acceptable we will begin to learn is not acceptable. What we thought was good, we will begin to learn is not good. And as our thoughts change, our actions then will perhaps even slowly begin to follow. The process of sanctification will, will start to shape us into becoming that which we already are. And the Christians in Thessalonica needed to hear that. Certainly Paul thought they needed to hear that. Sleeping around. <laughs> it needed to stop. You see, there is nothing casual, church, about casual sex. There's nothing casual about casual sex. God's image bearers are called to reflect God's image and not the image of the, of the culture that they are immersed in. God is calling the community of faith to be a pure community. And sex is a, is a gift given by God to be enjoyed in the confines of marriage, not for a time, but until death only separates them. And only where there is marital unfaithfulness, a breaking of a solemn trust, should such a bond even dare to be broken. Marriage is the joining of a man and a woman who, through mutual consent, live in an exclusive covenantal relationship. That's marriage. Why? Well, church, because that's what holiness looks like. And God calls his people to be holy even as he is holy. Sometimes that means it's going to be difficult. Sometimes that means it's going to be hard. Sometimes it means we're going to hear what we don't want to hear. And sometimes it means that God is calling us to do that which our natural selves don't want to do. And that's because God calls us to be holy. He calls his church to be a holy people. We see that in verse 7, don't we? For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. It may very well have been that there were some in the Thessalonian congregation who disagreed with Paul. I know there are many people when, I, when I've been uh, pastoring congregations who've disagreed with me. That's okay. And there would be many in the, or some, in the Thessalonian congregation who would have disagreed with Paul. What possible harm, Paul, could it do? Everyone else is doing it. You can hear them, can't you? Everyone else is, is doing it. Paul just doesn't understand how we Thessalonians live. And so Paul addresses those who disagree. Disagree with me, writes Paul, and you disagree not only with me but with God. Listen to what he says in verse 8. Therefore anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being but God, the very God who gives you his spirit. And so yes, Paul is speaking. The, the, the letter that they're reading has been penned by the, the hand of Paul or, or, or his scribe. And, and yes, what he, what he says stands in opposition to an entire culture. Yes, that's true. But what Paul says, he says only through the Holy Spirit's leading. His words are inspired words. Just as 
The Old Testament spoke, so now Paul speaks. Reject Paul and you reject who? Well, I reject Paul and you reject God. And those who are filled with the Holy Spirit will know that what Paul says are the very words of God. And of course, a great deal of what is being preached from pulpits right around this country today is shaped in many instances by culture and not by God's word, particularly, I might say, when it comes to sex and marriage, particularly when it comes to sex and marriage. And Paul reminds us, doesn't he, that, that what is acceptable in our culture does not automatically make it acceptable in the church. We are a peculiar people. We are a strange people. And when you sit on the bus and you have a conversation with someone, they should look at you and say, really? Really? Is that upsetting to you? And you say, yes, it is. Because God says, this is what is holy. God is the one who determines right and wrong. And so Paul's warning, warning to the church in Thessalonica is a warning to us. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. And so having addressed this important issue, Paul encourages the believers to, to let their lives speak to those outside the church. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, writes Paul. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent upon anybody. Verses 11 and 12. And so if outsiders, those who are not Christians, if they're going to to notice you, and they will notice you, if they're going to notice you, let it be because of your quiet confidence and because of your hard work. Don't let it be because you're living in such a way that you're bringing the name of the Lord Jesus Christ into disrepute because you're living like everyone else. When they notice you, let it be because of your quiet confidence and your hard work. What the world sees, says Paul, should be attractive and God will use that to, to draw those that he is calling out of the world to himself. You'll still be persecuted. You'll, you'll still be hated and misunderstood. But let it be because you honour God by working hard and because you have determined to live quiet lives. And finally, Paul addresses a concern that affects the life of every man and every woman. It affects the life of those who are in the church and it affects the life of those who are outside the church. Everyone, sooner or later, has to deal with death. Believers and unbelievers alike will die. And for the Christians in Thessalonica, this posed an unwelcome and maybe even an unexpected problem. You see, between Paul's departure from, from Thessalonica and Timothy's arrival with Paul's letter, someone or perhaps even a number of the brothers and sisters had died. What then should we think? What are we, what are we to do with this? We, we, we thought we'd moved from death to life. What, what, is this, what does this mean? Remember that Paul is here doing what? He's teaching us. And so when it comes to death, there are some things that we... Even us, today, need to learn. Death feels wrong, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It feels wrong, right? It shouldn't be. We, we all know that. And death inevitably leads to grief. Non-Christians grieve. But so do Christians. We also grieve. And the reason we grieve is because it hurts. We, we grieve because death is an unwelcome intruder. That's why we grieve. But although we grieve, our grieving is, is not the same as those in the world. It's not the same as those who don't believe. Brothers and sisters, writes Paul, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. You see, death is never a problem, is it? It's never a problem until it strikes us. Death is never a problem until we lose someone we love. And it struck the Thessalonian Christians, didn't it? 
And the difference, writes Paul, is not that we don't grieve. The difference is that we have hope. That, writes Paul, is the difference. We have hope. The world doesn't have it. Hope that just as Jesus rose again, those who follow him will also rise again. You see, some things are the same in the church and outside the church. We all die. Both the world and the church in that respect are the same. We're no different. But some things are not the same. You see, not everyone has hope. And so our grief is different. Christians grieve, but, but we grieve with a hope that will not disappoint us. Not maybe, but will not disappoint us. Death, writes Paul, is not the end. It's neither welcome nor wanted, but it is not the end. Therefore, writes Paul, encourage one another with these words. How does the world encourage one another? Well, the world encourages one another in several ways. One of the ways that the world encourages one another is by holding on to memories. You see, the world's encouragement always has to look back. It's actually no encouragement at all. It's depressing. It's depressing and it's futile because it never looks forward. And when it does look forward, it does so by inventing stories, hoping beyond hope that, that what their consciences tell them isn't true. But church, it is true. What your conscience is telling you is true. What my conscience tells me is true, that, that when we die, we will, each one of us, have to give an account. Isn't that what your conscience is telling you? It's what my conscience is telling me. It's what those I love, those who are in the Lord and those outside of the Lord, it's what their conscience is, is telling them. That when we die, we'll have to give an account. That unless God forgives us, our sin will find us out. And so what does Paul do? Well, he spends the rest of his life proclaiming the gospel. That's what he does. The rest of his life is spent proclaiming the gospel. That in Jesus there is forgiveness of sins. That in Jesus there is life beyond the grave. That in Jesus there is lasting hope. That's what Paul spends the rest of his life doing. It's better than being an accountant. Any accountants here? It is better than being an accountant, I'm sorry. It's better than being a Navy chaplain. It's better than being a policeman. It's better than anything else in the entire world to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ because in the gospel of Jesus Christ there is hope. Being an accountant is a good job, by the way, um, and any other jobs that are in here too. And so let me ask you this question and we'll finish with this. Do you, I wonder, have that hope have you repented of your sins and have you listened to what your conscience is telling you have you bowed the knee to jesus and because that is so is your life a living testimony to the truth and the power of the gospel that's all that matters let's pray father god we do thank you for paul's letter to the church in thessalonica we thank you because it's so full of wisdom so full of truths that we can apply to our own lives here. Lord, help us to live life to the fullest, but in such a way that you are honoured in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we think. And Lord, when we think about death, may we be not like the pagans. May we recognise that it is a doorway for those of us who are in Christ into the presence of the living God. And may that hope give us great comfort, great peace and great joy. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.